Well, this is, uh, I guess, a historical question, um, and I hope it's understood that by the way I maybe ask these questions, it, it, it may sound, and it does come from a place of naivety, uh, but it's it's um, just a means for me to give you a, a jumping off point, you know? So I'm, I'm referencing, I was, uh, again, reading other interviews that you had done and listened to uh, those as well, and I think at one point you mentioned, like, where, like, the first Afro-pessimists emerged and you and for me my framing of it has always been the transatlantic slave trade that's where this emerged but you pinpoint even further back in time where this emerged and um and i wanted to ask about that if you could please explain your your perspective historically where the afro-pessimistic uh framework really kind of emerged or or became a a relevant framing for this Yes, well, that was um, so. So I pieced together. I have not done the, the research on this, but I have been working with graduate students who who have. So I want to give real credit um, to people who pointed me to literature and 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 books. And the aha moment kind of went off for me because when I wrote my second book, Red, White, and Black: Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonism. I too was thinking that the you know like if, if if Marx talks about you know what is the inaugural moment ah well the inaugural moment is this era when Britain can uh, Britain's political economy which is moving towards a thing called capitalism it's not global Britain's political economy becomes so strong that two other really strong economies that are called merchant economies uh, and trade economies. Holland and France are now subsumed into the logic mm. so that they might become capitalist systems and then the capitalist system spreads globally. So how did this happen with anti-blackness? And so I'm thinking, okay, well, this is the Atlantic slave trade. But then the, the, there's just a ton of literature that I was not a, a, a aware of, which shows that really this begins with the slave trade in East Africa when uh, in 625 AD, when Arab states, uh, Moroccan Jews, um, uh, Chinese, East Indians, Iraqis, and Iranians, before they were even China, India, Iraq, you know, start vamping all on East Africa. And it's, and, and there's a kind of unconscious, but very powerful collective consensus that this place, which will one day become known as Africa, is a place of black people, and this word black keeps cropping up, and that they are always already slaves. They are always already socially dead. And and for most societies, everyone, every, every race of people has enslaved someone else. Every culture has enslaved someone else. Every culture has had people enslaved from their culture. But the interesting thing is that this word black begins to describe a catch-all of people who are not calling themselves black. Mm. They're calling themselves uh, uh, Buganda. They're calling themselves uh, Maasai. Uh, They're calling themselves Kikuyu. And black is a kind of word that is circulating in this period from 625 AD all the way to the Portuguese, among um, Arabs and Chinese and people like that to describe a position. And that's very fascinating to me. And so it's not slavery, which is primarily based upon uh, the need to uh, industrialize the Gulf Peninsula. Mm. It's it's a different kind of slavery. Um, Even though people are working on tea plantations, uh, in a place that's called Zanzibar, which uh, will later become a part of Tanzania, even though slaves are doing work, uh, real you know labor, in southwestern uh, I- Iran. Actually, what is what what the actually so, so what is slavery doing for that part of the world if it's not industrializing it in the way it will in the Western Hemisphere after 1452? Well, what it's doing. It's producing a community of non-slaves that will be global. Mm. People who will even 
fight each other, Iranians and Iraqis, but they have a, they're developing a baseline of who we are through who we are not. And it's very interesting um, and rather horrific that uh, basically uh, a lot of East African girls and boys are being harvested by the Arabs for sexual means, not for industrial means, right? So mm -hmm. the, what, we're say, what we're seeing is that what does it mean to have an, a family? Well, family uh, is secured at the, at the bottom, at the base level. Every family, whether it's under Oedipus or Eastern tradition or, or uh, Middle Eastern tradition, every family is organized around um, the incest taboo. The incest taboo. So who can you sleep with? Who can you not sleep with? And it's different, you know, who can you marry? Who can you not marry? How do we create families? How do we create this structure called filiation? And this, this idea of what are, the, what, are the, what are the acceptable liaisons between individuals and how do you form an institution called the family? This is growing in the Arab world. And it's growing in direct response to the destruction of that same capacity amongst African people. How do I mean that? I mean that because even though the incest taboo keeps the thing called the nuclear family stable, division, organized, allowed to accelerate itself, the unconscious resists the incest taboo. The, un the incest taboo is an imposition of the conscious mind against the onto the desires of the unconscious mind. So what I'm trying to say is that the psyche is a very chaotic place. The psyche is a very chaotic place where the desires for immediate gratification of the unconscious are always having to be run up against um, uh, or repressed by the pre-conscious mind, in order that people stay together and, 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 and go by the rules. So, in simple format, it meant that black women became repositories for licentious desire that could not be um, 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 performed on women who are part of the Arab world that could one day become your, your daughter or, or your, your wife, right? Mm -hmm. And black boys experienced what was called leveling at the scrotum, which is a thing where the Arabs uh, cut off their uh, uh, genitals and um, scraped their pelvic bone. And they marched these boys from the interior uh, to the coast. And any boy that did not bleed to death along the way was brought across the Gulf and became a eunuch in a harem. To you see what I'm saying? So, yeah. so proper proper ways of being with men and women were being uh, policed, and also um, the the desire to transgress those proper ways were being executed on black women and policed by black men who had no genitals. But here's the deal: in the literature, at a certain point in time, it becomes uh, necessary for uh, Arabs to start making, say, other non-Black people into eunuchs because um, women in the harem were, uh, were finding ways, ba basically cunnilingus, for uh, these eunuchs to satisfy them sexually. As they're supposed to be celibate, right, till their time to marry, you know? Right. And they were trying to find ways to find sexual gratification. And so, you know, it's, it, if it wasn't so so horrifying, it'd be comical, you know, asking the eunuchs to perform oral sex on them. And the Arabs didn't want black men doing this. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is that, and then in literature, you know, you have no more friend in the black slave than you have in the dog. All of these, all of these psychic symptoms of what blackness means in the mind are actually not developed by the Portuguese in 1452 in the slave trade. They go back almost 600 years uh, before that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and 
1,200 years before that. Um, so this is, this is anti-blackness then organizes what we call the libidinal economy, the collective unconscious of the world, even if anti-blackness is performed differently from country to country. Mm. Wow. Just taking it in for a second. Okay. Um, so we went back in time. Now I'm going to do a thing where we jump forward in time a bit. <laughs> um, so my, the question that came up while I was listening to you and, and just again, just before this interview began um, is, I mean, you, you say this in your book as well, that really, I guess the, you said this earlier, just that other oppressed groups would not take much pleasure in seeing this country burnt to the ground while black people may have that, uh, that feeling, uh, I guess that's a part of the, the experience. Um, and I guess uh, my, my question really it just comes down to this. Is there ever going to be a point in the future where Afro-pessimism will not be, will not accurately describe the black experience? And if so, how would that occur uh, in your, in your understanding? <laughs> well, you know, the answer to that question is seditious, so I'll pass. <laughs> oh, you're not going to answer it. Okay, well. I mean, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of in front in the old coach, but, but you know, if I were to actually say, let me, let me put it like, let me put it diagnostically, okay, um, because, it, because I, I'm, I'm kind of tongue in cheek here. I mean, if I were to <laughs> answer you tactically, yes, that would be a crime, right? <laughs> sure, right, right, right. Yeah, if there's a way of using a kind of innuendo or something to allude to what you really feel, um, yeah. Look, Here's the deal. There can be no world without black people. And, and my, my, my symptomatic uh, uh, memory or, or rearticulation of the Arab dynamic, what am I trying to say there? I'm trying to say world is being made from 625 AD all the way up for the next thousand years, right? World is being made, the world of the Arab family, okay? And so there can be no world without anti-blackness. And there can be no blacks in the world. My, dis my description of the harem should anecdotally s explain what I mean by that. There can mm -hmm. be no world without anti-blackness, and there can be no blacks in the world, okay? So the, the, the destruction of black femininity, or Af it's not even black at that point, it's African femininity, so that um, the, because um, the, the mind is always aggressive against any form of constraints. And yet, if you don't have constraints, you can't have community. And so how do you find a grounding wire for the constraints that are not acceptable to your coherence and stability of your community? Well, the grounding wire in, in and I don't like this word primitive, but in, I'm doing a quotation, in so-called primitive societies, the grounding wire were um, uh, burning things in effigy, uh, dance rituals with masks and that kind of thing, you know, so that you you expel the, your transgr transgr transgressing desires onto rituals of performance. Mm. Well, the grounding wire for the past 1,300 years has been those same kind of rituals danced around the fire, but instead they're the lynching and the destruction of black bodies, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think that there cannot be a world as we know it with black people who are free. And when this world as we know it ends, there will be sentient beings like you and I on the other side, but they will not be black and they will not be human. There will be another category, mm -hmm. set of categories. Mm -hmm. That's not going to come about through negotiation mm. or consciousness raising. Right. There isn't any kind of legislation that Congress could pass to bring that about, right? <laughs> Very seriously. <laughs> I like to pass a bill to end the United States and everything around it. All those in favor, raise your hand. Yeah, no, not to me. 